The nerve cell has several different components. It has a cell body. It has extensions called dendrites. There is another process called the axon. This cell communicates with other cells. So here's another cell, and it receives information from this neuron, and we call this the synapse. What we're doing now is we're going to measure how strong the synapse is. And we'll do that by zapping the sensory neuron with an electrical pulse. And then we tell the sensory neuron, send information now. So we do that once. Keep turning up the voltage until the sensory neuron finally decides to uh, fire an action potential. What you see is when the sensory neuron does send information down its axon via the synapse to the postsynaptic neuron, we see by this red trace is that the motor neuron received that information. This has been growing for about four or five days. The two cells touch and they start forming synapses. How do you turn a short-term memory into a long-term memory? What happens in the brain when you remember something for your lifetime? And we found that when you produce short-term memory, there was no change in how the synapses looked anatomically. All the changes were biochemical, they were occurring in the cell. But when you stimulated repeated training, when you produced long-term memory, we saw to our astonishment, there was a growth of new synaptic connections. So this is a neuron, a sensory neuron, that we've put in a dish all by itself. It is programmed into these neurons to find a partner. That's what they do, that's their purpose, is to form a synapse to transmit information. So this sensory neuron will continue growing, sending processes out in all directions, constantly looking for a partner until it finds one. Once the sensory neuron finds its postsynaptic partner, it will send processes very rapidly all over that postsynaptic partner. And every once in a while, you can see a little swelling. For example, there in the green process, in the green sensory process, you see a little swelling. That's something that we call a varicosity. And the varicosity is the synapse. That's where the synapses are found. That's where information transfer occurs. What my work has shown is that the chemical synapse is the key to understanding learning and memory. The chemical synapse is not fixed. It is plastic. It can be altered by activity. In short-term memory, when you activate the system only once, you just increase the function, so you release more transmitter. In long-term memory, you actually turn on genes and you grow new synaptic connections. What you're seeing here is an example of the kind of changes that go on when we learn, when a new memory is formed. You have a pre-existing synapse that buds. It forms a completely new synapse. So this swelling gives rise to a completely new swelling. So that's the type of structural change that occurs when we learn. So short-term memory is restricted to the synapse. Long-term memory involves the nucleus, which now sends messenger RNAs to the synapses, and it gives rise to the growth of new synaptic connections. What you're seeing is a lot of the messenger RNA being produced inside the nucleus and then spilling out and being shuttled all the way down the axons. And that bright particle that's traveling down that axon is a bundle of a large number of instructions for how to make proteins. And then the synapse uses whatever resources it has available to it locally to take those instructions and make a protein. The target of doing all of that of sending proteins down the axon, of sending messages down the axons. All of that is trying to accomplish one thing, which is to make that generate that. This is the end product. This is learning.